the National Endowment for the Humanities, bringing you the stories that define us. I was born Thokmetany, meaning shell flower, in the year they called 1844, or close to that. I was a very small child when the first white strangers came into our country. They came like a roaring lion, and have continued so ever since. I have never forgotten their first coming. When my grandfather, Truckee, a medicine chief of the Paiute Nation, first got word from his scouts of white men coming east from California, he was so happy. My white brothers, my long-looked-for white brothers have come at last, he said, for we had legends about ancient times when we were split apart from fair-skinned brothers because we couldn't understand each other, but one day we were to grow together again. My grandfather, a healer, saw that time could be now. He took some of his leading men to welcome them, making signs of friendship, and throwing his arms up to show he had no weapons, but he was kept at a distance. He tried for several days, but seeing they were afraid of him, he left them alone, hoping they would return the next year. The great emigration then began, and more Americans showed up every year. On the third year, my grandfather met and befriended Captain Fremont. They met where the railroad crosses the Truckee River, now called Wadsworth, Nevada. Captain Fremont gave my grandfather the name of Captain Truckee, and named that river after him. Truckee is one of my people's words. It means all right or very well. My grandfather went away with the captain after this to fight in Mexico. My grandfather and 11 men returned from the war. One died on the way home. They returned with guns and some soldiers' clothes with brass buttons, and they showed us some of the English language. They were very proud of all these things, which were so strange to us. My grandfather was most proud of a piece of paper given to him for his heroics that he said could talk, and indeed it spoke and protected him many times. That same fall, our very first white brothers came amongst us. They could not get over the mountains and had to live with us along the Carson River, where the great Carson City stands now. We helped them and gave them food so they could eat that winter. We are called savages and blood-seeking by the colonists in this land, Yet did we seek to kill them or steal their horses? Did we hold out our hands for money and say, you can't have anything to eat unless you pay me? The following spring, we had fearful news from the other tribes that the people whom we called our white brothers were killing everybody that came in their way. And so we went into the mountains to hide for fear of our lives. The story of the Donner Party came to my tribe too, as horror stories. We were told that white men were killing everyone so they could eat them. One day, while fishing in the Humboldt River, we were alerted that white men were coming. Everyone ran, but my poor mother was left with my little sister and me, my sister on her back and me too frightened to move at all. My aunt came across her, unsuccessfully trying to get me to move my feet and said, let us bury our girls or we shall all be killed and eaten up. They buried us and planted sage brushes to cover our faces and keep the sun from burning them telling us if we were to cry out, they'd hear us, and then we'd certainly be killed and eaten. Can you imagine my feelings, buried alive, thinking every minute that I was to be unburied and eaten up by the very people that my grandfather loved so much? I lay there all day, feeling the night would never come, crying so my heart felt like it would come out of my mouth. My father wasn't as trusting or optimistic of the white folks as my grandfather was. He had dreams from the spirits, visions of the future, and gathered our people together to tell them that things were going to get worse for us. But before speaking of bad news, we celebrated our getting together, as is tradition. We have races and hunts, and men and women get to meet each other. We sing and dance, and the men smoke around the fire at night and come to understandings. Over the next few years, more and more immigrants came. 
Our winter supplies were burned one year, and the following fall, some men, including my uncle, were killed while on a fishing trip. My uncle's widow and my mother and father all cut off their beautiful long hair and cut long gashes in their arms and legs, bleeding, for this is how we honor our dead. A widow cuts off her hair, braids it, puts it across her husband's breast, and is to remain unmarried until her hair is the same length as before. Men also cut their hair in mourning. It was after all of this that my grandfather took my siblings, mother, and me, and some others to California. My father was to stay with the tribe in Nevada. Grandfather told us about the houses that travel on the water and their great bells, the guns that shot bullets as large as a man's head to distant hills, and many other wonders we couldn't believe. I saw my first white people traveling there, though I was too afraid to leave my mother's robes and meet them. My father had said that they looked like giant owls and they appeared thus to me with their hairy faces and bright white eyes. We returned to find our tribe totally decimated by the plague. We thought it was the white people poisoning our river. My grandfather, of course, had to calm and assure us this wasn't the case, as they too would be dead from drinking it. The next six years I lived in Genoa with a Major Ormsby to be friends with his daughters and learn English and Spanish. So with my three Indian dialects, by age 14 I spoke five languages— I can tell you now how powerful education is, and why I want to school Indian children. I spent my whole life seeing my people taken advantage of over and over by dishonest men, because they couldn't understand what they were made to sign their names to. The Ormsbys were beloved friends, as were many of our white brothers and sisters in the Carson Valley. Another white man, who was dearly loved by my people, named Mr. McCullen, and his business partner had a store 30 miles down from the Carson River, but were robbed as they took all of their money to go to California to get provisions for the winter. The thieves stuck arrows in the bullet holes to make it look like they were killed by Indians. Major Ormsby showed these arrows to my father, asking if he knew where they were from. They were arrows from the Washoe tribe, and although the Washoes knew that nobody from their tribe was unaccounted for, and so couldn't have committed these distant murders, they were made to sacrifice two of their men to be killed for justice or the army would have attacked us all. The Washos gave their innocent blood to save our people, and I will never stop hearing the cries of the wives and mothers and brothers of those sacrificed. Sarah's grandfather, Chief Truckee, died soon after this, in 1860. Upon his wishes, Sarah went to a convent school in San Jose, California, but was sent home after just a few weeks due to complaints by wealthy parents about their children being in school with an Indian. Well, she made it home safely, but soon after the War of 1860 began, like this. Two young girls went missing in the woods. The Paiutes, skilled at reading their native land, offered their help and tracked the girls to a cabin on the Carson River, home to a couple of traders. Returning a second time, after finding nothing the first, the girls were finally found, kept below a trap door. Seeing the horror of what was done to the girls, the men were killed on the spot and their cabin burned. The newspaper in the West then read, The bloodthirsty savages had murdered two innocent, hard-working, industrious, kind-hearted settlers, and word was sent to California for army soldiers. The war began. War is always a tragedy. This one, no different. Major Ormsby, the man who helped raise Sarah alongside his daughters and daughter English, was made to be in charge of the war campaign, and he was killed in the chaos of battle. The war lasted for three months. The peace treaty reserved Pyramid Lake for the Paiutes. The Paiutes were to receive supplies from a U.S. agent assigned to them, But although Sarah records knowing of 13 agents across 23 years at the Pyramid Lake Reservation, the supplies they received when signing the treaty were the first and the last that they saw. Let me explain the idea of Indian agencies for you. We who are native to this land never thought of the earth as personal property. We would move throughout the region living on what nature provided. The Americans, though, settle the land, as they say. 
The goal was to contain us to the places they didn't want, and thus we were to be settled too. Stuck in the land reserved for us, the government was to feed us for remaining peaceful on our reservations. To handle this trade with us, your big father, or president as you call him, appointed civilian men and named them agents. This position ended up being perfect for men who didn't mind keeping and selling for profit the supplies they were given, thus starving us and forcing us to labor for them. I say force because to leave the area reserved for us is to be hunted. In 1864, my father, originally a Shoshone named Polito, or Chief Winnemucca as he's now known, took some of our family to the great Virginia city to look for sympathetic ears to tell of my people's hardship. For we knew many of the Americans were kind and generous, and Virginia City was one of the richest places on earth. 